Vladika, fathers, brothers and sisters, friends, it's a great joy to be here. Um, and as um, just been said, I was here at the last occasion. It is wonderful to come back and see how things are developed in the school that was being set up. I also apologize that I'm speaking in English. My Russian is not very good. My Estonian is non-existent. So, so love, its nature, what it is, how to achieve it, where it leads, is really far from the thought of Sir Maximus the Confessor. We know very little for sure about the details of his early life, but it seems that he was a monk from at least his early 30s and very quickly came to be regarded with reverence. Within a few years as a monk, he had attracted a disciple called Anastasius, who remained with him until the end of his life, save when they were separated after his arrest and trial. They died together in exile in Nazica, now part of modern Georgia. Maximus cannot have been a monk for much more than 10 years before he found himself consulted by others, other monks, prominent lay people in the Byzantine court, even bishops about matters of theology, especially ascetic theology. He had become, in practice, an elder, a stariets, from whom people sought spiritual wisdom. Only in the last 20 or so years of his life did Maximus find himself caught up in the defense of orthodoxy in opposition to the attempts by the hierarchs of the court and the emperor himself, first emperor Heraclius, famed for his recovery of the relic of the Holy Cross from the Persians, even though eventually he lost most of the eastern provinces of the Roman or Byzantine Empire to the Muslim Arabs, and then Heraclius' grandson, Constans II, attempts to reach a compromise over Christological doctrine with those whom Maximus and the Orthodox regarded as Monophysites. In this struggle for orthodoxy, understood by the, the emperor as seditious opposition to his imperial authority, Maximus suffered arrest trial and disgrace, and eventually exile and ill-treatment, leading to his death at the age of 82 in 1662. It is for this struggle, for the truth of the faith, that Maximus was eventually styled the confessor. At one point, towards the end of his first trial in Constantinople in 655, Maximus was asked by the head of the civil administration who was conducting the trial, why do you love the Romans and hate the Greeks? To which Maximus replied, we have a commandment not to hate anyone. I love the Romans because we share the same faith, whereas I love the Greeks because we share the same language. In what was really a show trial, Maximus, with immense dignity, drew the process back to the question of love, protesting his love for those who, like him, adhered to the true faith, as well as for those who put him on trial, his fellow countrymen, fellow speakers of Greek. Maximus' quiet words to his accusers at his trial speak of love. In this brief talk, we shall not any further be concerned with the calamitous events of his latter years, but rather with the writings that he had produced from the quiet of the cloister to a host of inquirers who sought his guidance over how to live a true Christian life, inquirers who included both monks and lay people. There is hardly a page in his writings that survive from his early monastic period on which Maximus does not reflect on the nature of love. Among his writings, there is one, one of the most famous, included in the 18th century anthology of ascetic and mystical texts, the Philokalia, or in Russian or Slavonic, the Dabratolubia, called Four Centuries on Love. This is a collection of brief reflections, about a paragraph or so in length, arranged in groups of 100 chapters. The number 100 is symbolic, symbolic of completeness, and such collections were, by Maximus's time, an established monastic genre, a collection of thoughts to be read slowly and pondered over. You've asked me to talk about love as pedagogy, and though one could easily develop such a theme from the centuries on love, or some of his other monastic writings, 
which take the form of responses to questions put by others. There is one work of Maximus's which is not just about love as pedagogy, but exemplifies love as pedagogy. It is an example of love it is an example of love as pedagogy, rather than a, thesis, a treatise about love. It is one of his letters in the collection that we have, letter number two, addressed to a friend of his, John the Chamberlain, or Cubicularios, a high-ranking member of the imperial court. These Cubicularii were eunuchs who, who had access to the private quarters of the court and therefore to the empress and other women of the court, as well as to the emperor when he withdrew from the public areas of the court. Such cubicularii therefore had privileged access to the emperor, as well as the empress, who might well be able to influence her husband. These were important figures. There are several letters from Maximus to John the Chamberlain, who seems to have been close to Maximus, his spiritual disciple, as well as a dear friend. The subject of the letter is love, agape, and is addressed not exclusively to John, but to what appears to be a group of Maximus' spiritual disciples in the court. The first thing I want to draw attention to about Maximus' letter is how he addresses his correspondents. He says of them, that you cleave through grace to holy love towards God and your neighbour, and care about appropriate ways of practicing this. And goes on to say that he knows from his own personal knowledge of them, and is sure that in his absence this is no less true, that you suffer these things that belong to divine love in order to possess this divine thing, which in its power is beyond circumscription and definition. And he goes on to assert that nothing is more truly godlike than divine love nothing more mysterious, nothing more capable of raising human beings to deification. One is tempted to take this praise of his hearers as simply a captatio benevolentiae, a literary convention, flattering a little those he is addressing. But this is, I am con convinced, a mistake, for it seems to me to be part of Maximus's love as pedagogy, that he draws attention to the love that he can already see in those who are turning to him for spiritual advice and wisdom. It is not flattery, but a way of getting his hearers to realize that they already know something about divine love, that they are already reaching out to it, exercising it in their attempts to live in accordance with the gospel. This, of course, may well have been true in differing degrees. In some, the light of love may have been a fierce flame. In others, not much more than a flickering spark. We have no way of telling. But we can see how Maximus begins by affirming their intent, their desire. He begins by assuring his hearers that they already know what he is talking about. They already know something about love. And as pedagogy, this seems to me to be important. Love is itself pedagogy. It is by loving that we learn to love. Although love is for Maximus something exalted, there is, he has already affirmed, nothing more godlike, nothing more mysterious, nothing more capable of raising us toward deification. It is also something present to us, something we all know even if only fitfully or partially. Maximus doesn't present love as some impossible ideal, only conceivable in the saints. Maximus then goes on to show how all the virtues, all the dispositions, habits, are embraced by love. Love embraces and entails faith and hope. But it is not only faith and hope that love embraces, it embraces, too, humility, meekness, gentleness, mercy, self-control and patience, long-suffering and kindness, peace and joy. Having just seen that wonderful recital of 1 John 13, 
in different languages by the children. All that is echoing in your minds now, and you can see that Maximus is also echoing this very chapter of St. Paul. His words echo St. Paul's hymn to love. He plays with this sense of the entwining of the virtues in love. He summarizes what he's been saying in these words. Faith is the foundation of everything that comes after it. I mean hope and love. And firmly establishes what is true. Hope is the strength of the extremes. I mean faith and love. For it appears as faithful by itself and loved by both and teaches through itself to make it to the end of the course. Love is the fulfillment of these, wholly embraced as the final last desire and furnishes them rest from their movement. For love gives faith the reality of what it believes and hope the presence of what it hopes for and the enjoyment of what is present. Love alone, properly speaking, proves that the human is in the image of the creator. That last point is worth dwelling over. Love proves that we are in the image of the creator. First, because God creates out of love, and so our love is a reflection of the divine love and makes clear our being in the image of God, katikona tu theu, but also that to be human is to be in the image of God. It is what we are, what we really are. We shall come back to this in a moment. Maximus continues by demonstrating how easily we have fallen from this natural state of being who we are. By the deceit of the devil, we have turned away from God and turned in on ourselves. We have made ourselves the center of existence rather than God the creator, who really is the center of all that is. And turning in on ourselves, our love is turned into self-love, Philaftia. But we are all different selves. We all behave as if we were each of us the center of the world. And so instead of there being one true center of existence, namely God the Creator, each one of us imagines that we are each of us the center of the world. And we are all wrong. These imagined worlds centered on ourselves clash. I want what you want, you want what somebody else wants. Instead of the world existing as a harmony, it is now characterized by division and fragmentation. Imagining ourselves to be the center of the universe is, first of all, Maximus suggests, a matter of ignorance. It is just wrong. This ignorance leads to self-love, self-love to tyranny, tyranny over others, if we have the chance, but worse still, tyranny over ourselves. What ought to be the case is that reason, instead of being ignorant, and I'm quoting from Maximus, ought to be moved through knowledge to seek solely after God. And desire, pure of the passion of self-love, ought to be driven by yearning to enjoy God alone. And our spirited or insensitive power, separated from tyranny, ought to struggle to attain God alone. And the blessed and divine love which is fashioned from these and through which these come to be, will embrace God and show the one who loves God to be God himself. But none of this holds. We are at odds with ourselves, fragmented and divided in our hearts. There is nothing we can do on our own to remedy the, our condition. For this reason, for our sake and from us and through us, God became holy man to such a degree that unbelievers thought that he was not God, while existing as God to such a degree that to believers was granted the ineffable and true meaning of reverent religion. The power of love was renewed in the incarnate God and self-love uprooted with the uprooting of self-love, which is, as they say, the beginning and mother of all evils, everything that comes from it and after it is plucked out as well. This love, which we see in Christ, has no shadow of self-love, and so is completely vulnerable. And it is on the cross that we see the triumph of love. And Maximus recaps what he has said in these words. 
Love is therefore a great good, and of goods the first and most excellent good, since it is through God and through it, since through it God and man are drawn together in a single embrace, and the creator of humankind appears as human through the undeviating likeness of the deified to God in the good so far as is possible for humankind. And the interpretation of love is this, to love the Lord God with all the heart and soul and power and the neighbor as oneself, which is, if I might express it in a definition, Maximus goes on, the inward universal relation to the first good connected with the universal purpose of our natural kind. There is something paradoxical about what Maximus is asserting here. On the one hand, love lay bare, lays bare the true nature of human beings. On the other hand, love raises us to become God himself, to deification. And here we touch on something utterly characteristic of Maximus's teaching, that in becoming divine, becoming God, we become what we most truly are, what we are meant to be, in short, truly human. Nature and grace are not opposed, rather grace lays bare our true nature. Elsewhere in Maximus's writings, this understanding of deification through love is pursued in ways that are, I think, worth recalling here. First, there is Maximus's surprising philosophical notion that virtue is natural. For Aristotle, with whose philosophy Maximus was well acquainted, virtue is ethical, a matter of practice. It's not natural. One place where Maximus raises this is in the famous public debate that took place in 645 over the nature of Christ with Pyrrhos, one-time patriarch of Constantinople and a convinced follower of the imperial Christological nostrums, that, for Maximus, betrayed the faith of the ecumenical councils. Pyrrhus finds Maximus' idea that love is natural, baffling. If love is natural, he says, why are not all humans equally virtuous, he asks. What is the point of ascetic struggle and the discipline of the Christian life? Maximus doesn't in any way deny the importance of ascetic struggle, but insists that it is properly understood. Discipline, training, and the toils that go with it were devised simply for the purpose of separating from the soul in those who love virtue the deceit that infects it through the senses. It is not as if the virtues have been lately introduced from outside, for they were inserted in us from creation, as has been already said. Once, therefore, deceit has been completely expelled from us. At that moment, too, the soul manifests the radiance of its natural virtue. Virtue is natural. The virtues describe the lineaments of that nature. It is only because of a deceit lodged in the soul that discipline, training, and toil are necessary. I avoided translating the Greek word ascesis, as asceticism, but that seems to me to prejudge immediately issues that need consideration. The word ascesis generally means training or exercise. So I've translated it disciplined training. But the verb from which it derives, askeo, originally meant to work with raw materials. And I'm attracted by the idea that the root meaning of ascesis, too, is to work with raw materials, the raw materials of our humanity, and out of it make something fine, a way of understanding that would tie in with the root meaning of the Greek word for virtue, arete, which means excellence. It seems to me that to accord with what Maximus meant by ascesis, for he... It seems to me to accord with what Maximus meant by ascesis, for he saw humankind as created in the image of God with the purpose of attaining the divine likeness. And that working with the raw materials of our humanity, even in paradise, would entail uniting our being and our eternal being, both gifts of God, by means of being well, 
and so bringing into being an eternal well-being in which the divine image attains the divine likeness. This triad, being, well-being, eternal being, is a fundamental aspect of Maximus's ontology of the created rational being and expresses his idea that virtue, well-being, unites God's gifts of being an eternal being, leading to eternal well-being, the eternal life with God, for which created rational beings are intended. Which leads me, at any rate, to another consideration expressed very clearly at the very beginning of the first century on love, where Maximus defines love and how we are to achieve it. The first chapter, paragraph, defines love. Love, agape, is a good disposition of the soul according to which it prefers none of the things that are to the knowledge of God. It is impossible to come to possession of this love if one has any inclination towards earthly things. And then follow two chapters with a chiastic structure, a kind of cross structure. Apathia, which I don't translate leave, means something like serenity or tranquility, gives birth to love, hope in God to apathia, patience and long-suffering to hope. All-embracing self-mastery is the source of these, and the fear of God is the source of self-mastery, and faith in God produces fear. And then the next chapter. He who believes in God fears punishment. He who fears punishment masters the passions. He who masters his passions endures tribulation. He who endures tribulation will possess hope in God. Hope in God separates, all earthly, separates off all earthly inclination. The intellect separated from this will possess love towards God. The first of these chapters has the sequence, love, apathia, hope, patience and long-suffering, self-mastery, fear of God, faith in the Lord. The second has a matching chiastic structure, faith in God, fear of punishment, mastery of the passions, tribulation, endurance of tribulation, hope, separation from earthly inclination, which is the same as apathia, and love of God. There are several points to notice about this sequence. First, it is a sequence. There is a way that leads to love that we can discern. Love is something, therefore, that we can learn. We can do something about it. Another point to notice is that these two chapters, and it's not, I think, a point that's been generally noticed, are an expansion of a few verses in St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, Romans 5, 3 to 5, where the apostle says, not only that, but we also boast in tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about endurance, endurance testing, testing hope. Hope is not ashamed because the love of God is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit has given us. Note the sequence, tribulation, endurance, testing, hope, love. Maximus' sequence provides an introduction to tribulation from faith, fire, fear, and self-mastery, and makes apathia the bridge from hope to love. The parallel is so close that it cannot be chance coincidence. The main difference between the apostle and the monk is that Paul, when he talks about tribulation, is envisaging a situation of persecution, which is what Thlipsis, tribulation, in Paul's writings refers to. Whereas Maximus envisages by tribulation the life of the monk, and indeed any Christian who takes his faith seriously, where the tribulation arises from the spiritual struggle of his Christian life. And this leads him to the classical Christian or monastic virtues of self-mastery, enkratia, and apathia, calm, detachment, serenity. The transition from martyr to monk is a commonplace in scholarship about the rise of monasticism, and it is clearly discernible here. Love is then, for Maximus, a pedagogy. We learn to love by loving. There is a way, which is the demanding way of ascetic struggle, but that struggle is not an attempt to bend our nature into something unnatural, but rather a way of laying bare what is natural, who we really are, 
what is, to use Maximus's characteristic vocabulary, the logos of our being, to live in accordance with what God, as creator, intended for us, for each one of us. And that can be described as becoming God, deification, or equally as becoming truly human, the human being God intended each one of us to be. I've been asked, Irina insisted, that I add something about St. Gregory Palamas. I feel much less able to do this than to talk about St. Maximus. That's partly because I feel a much greater intellectual and spiritual affinity with St. Maximus than with St. Gregory. And that is partly owing to the fact that the bulk of, the, the, of Palamas's works were inevitably, given his situation, polemical. He found himself caught up in the Hesychast controversy in which he defended the Athenite monks, the Hesychasts, and their conviction that in their prayer they were able to draw close to God and behold the uncreated light of the Godhead against accusations that such claims were illusory and based on experiences that were no more than hallucination. I have very little taste for polemical writing and none at all for Byzantine polemics in which one was expected to pursue one's opponent relentlessly rather than listen to him or her and try to understand what it was they were getting at. St. Gregory is not unusual in doing this. It was expected of him, but I find it difficult to warm to him in his polemical vein. And the vast bulk of his, his writings are polemical. There are, of course, his homilies. But again, he belonged to a tradition that expected homilies to be rhetorical rather than direct. And beside that, there are a few more, beside that, there are a few more personal letters. And though they belong to a strictly monastic genre, difficult to take out of that very specific context, I shall try to do what I can. But forgive me if I seem less eloquent than in talking about St. Maximus. Nevertheless, I want to start from something Maximus said at the very height of the controversy with Valam, the Calabrian monk, whose attack on the Hesychast monks had led Gregory to mount a counterattack. In one of his letters to Valam, St. Gregory has this to say. It is not safe for those who do not know how to speak to God to speak about God. For those, or nor for those to judge about the immaterial light who do not know what can be apprehended beyond the light and have not been initiated into the intellectual part of the soul and the life hidden in Christ by the true and intellectual light as having truly found and been raised to the first resurrection. It is not safe for those who do not know how to speak to God to speak about God. If we do not how to know how to speak to God, then the God about whom we speak will be no more than a concept. And it is on this that I want to dwell to start off with briefly. It is all too easy to talk about God. We have centuries of theological and philosophical reflection on the divine, arguments for God's existence, arguments about his nature, and so on. But all this is talk, St. Gregory points out. All this talk is no more than chatter, and worse than that, dangerous chatter. If it is detached from any genuine experience of God, detached from any attempt, however frail and tentative, to speak to God, to pray to him. Outside a prayerful attempt to respond to the love of God, our words about him are empty. At the heart of the Hesychast controversy was a misunderstanding, to put it at its simplest, about the notion of apophatic theology. Apophatic theology, the terminology belongs to Dionysius the Areopagite, St. Dionysius the Great, as Palamas calls him, is a theology in which we deny the concepts we have of God. Apophysis in Greek is the, uh, apophysis is the Greek for denial. But such denial of concepts can have different motivations. It can simply be an intellectual realization that God is beyond our understanding. And if that is all, it is apophatic theology, it is 
apophatic theology that becomes hard to distinguish from a kind of sceptical agnosticism. But this was not what Dionysius meant, nor what apophatic theology had been taken to mean in the post-Dionysian tradition from Maximus to Palamas. As Dionysius himself puts it, apophysis in theology is not a matter of depriving God of something, but rather of acknowledging that God transcends even the most exalted concept we have of him. And how does that acknowledgement come about? Not because of some intellectual apprehension of the nature of the infinite, but from our experience, our experience of God as always greater, always beyond our attempts to reach out towards him, an experience that yields a sense that God is beyond experience even, an experience of wonder, of amazement, that we sense as we sense that any intimation that we have of God discloses something that, to use the expression of the English poet John Keats, teases us out of thought. In his letter to a nun, a quite late letter in his life, a nun Ksenia, St. Gregory suggests to her that in our experience of God, there is both an extraordinary sense of exaltation and an eradicable sense of grief or sorrow. The exaltation comes about as the noose, the intellect, realizes its true state as it glimpses a sense of contemplation of God. Gregory quotes Evagrius, whom he thought to be St. Nilos, speaking of the intellect's true state as somewhat resembling the, the sky's hue, which is filled with the light of the Holy Trinity during the time of prayer, a hue or color like that of sapphire, and goes on to quote St. Isaac the Syrian, saying that prayer is the purity of the intellect. It is consummated when we are illumined in utter amazement by the light of the Holy Trinity. This sense of exaltation, of an exhilarating experience of purity, a kind of diaphanous transparency to the divine is, however, combined with a sense of grief. Grief at all that dims and snatches us back from this sense that we belong with God. And this grief has two stages. One of repentance, and then of what I can only describe as baffled, almost uncomprehending acknowledgement. Gregory puts it like this. Let us add another still clearer example of what we are saying. The first stage of grief resembles the return of the prodigal son. For this reason, it fills the mourner with dejection and leads him to employ these very words, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the consummation of grief resembles the moment when the heavenly father runs out to meet him and embraces him. And when the son finds himself accepted with such inexpressible compassion, and on account of it is filled with great joy and boldness, he receives the father's embrace and embraces him in return. Then entering into the father's house, he shares together in the feast of divine felicity. The apophatic is not a merely intellectual acknowledgement of the wonder and mystery of God. It needs to rise from the depth of our being, from the heart, the broken and troubled heart that God will not despise, as Psalm 50 puts it. It is about rising towards God, but that metaphor means certainly to turn to God and seek him directly, which, as the gospel reminds us, means both some kind of seclusion, when you pray, go into your chamber, and seek your father who is in secret, but also willingness to encounter God in the least of his little ones. This is something we need to remember for the entry into the dazzling darkness, into the apophatic knowledge of God, where we should be overwhelmed by the light of God, is not necessarily something mystical in the way the word is used today in the West. It is much more a sense of turning away from our concepts and strategies, the ways in which we make ourselves at home in the world, 
and seeking to enter the world as God created it. In the brothers Karamazov, the elder Zasima tells a story of his elder brother, Markiel, who abandoned the Christianity of his youth and then found himself victim to an incurable disease. He is on his deathbed, but despite his mother's pleas, refuses to see a priest or receive Holy Communion. Then, eventually, in response to his mother's grief, he agrees to see the priest. He makes his confession and receives communion. And after receiving the holy gifts, finds himself transformed. Everything is beautiful. Can't you see, he cries to his grieving mother, everything is beautiful. The trees, the birds, the whole of nature. Paradise is all about us. All we have to do is open our eyes. Markel had let go of his stubborn opposition to his mother and in letting go of his stubbornness, had come to repentance and found that the gates of repentance open onto paradise. Similarly, in, similarly the way to God, turning to God himself by way of what Dionysius called apophatic theology is by way of repentance, by letting go of our ways of making something of God and allowing ourselves to be made something by God himself. As Vladimir Lossky put it in a very famous quotation from his book, The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church, the apophatic way of Eastern theology is the repentance of the human person before the face of the living God. It is the constant transformation of the creature tending towards its completeness, towards that union with God which is brought about through divine grace and human freedom. But the fullness of, the, of Godhead, the ultimate fulfillment towards which all created persons tend, is revealed in the Holy Spirit. It is he, the mystagogue of the apophatic way, whose negations attest the presence of the unnameable, the uncircumscribed, the absolute plenitude. The apophatic attitude is one which can see the fundamental character of all theological thought. So the, the apophatic character attitude in which one can see the fundamental character of all theological thought within the Eastern tradition is an unceasing witness rendered to the Holy Spirit who makes up all deficiencies, calls all limitations to be overcome, confers upon the knowledge of the unknowable, the fullness of experience and transforms the divine darkness into light wherein we have communion with God. Love as pedagogy. What I think we learn from St. Gregory Palamas, which complements what we have learned in St. Maximus, is that fundamental to our experience of God, an experience which is one of love in response to his love, that this is founded on repentance. Repentance that breaks up our certainties, breaks up our tendency to find a way in which we are in control and enables the image of God in which we have been created to emerge from the ruins that our repentance seems to have led to. Ruins in which we begin to see what it is that God is making of us, of me, of each, each of us unique in his eyes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Now it's time for questions. Palunet professor selgitaks lähemalt natuke mõtet, et jumalikustumine tähendab tõeliselt inimeseks saamist. Et mida tähendab tõeliselt inimeseks saamine? I'll try to translate it. Hopefully it will be a right attempt. So, uh, could you explain, please, uh, the process of, kind of becoming uh, as a god is a process of... Deification. 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 Deification.
Yeah. What do you mean with that? A lot of people who don't understand this, people who criticize the, the orthodox doctrine of deification, seem to think that deification means that we cease to be human and attain some kind of ethereal state. Now, I don't think that's what any orthodox mean at all. But Maximus seems to me to be very clear that the whole doctrine of deification, there are two things about deification that are important to him. One is that the process of coming to know God and to love God, if you like, and also to be God, is actually involves serious change in ourselves. That we cannot, we cannot begin to experience deification by just simply going on as we ordinarily are. It actually involves genuine repentance, a genuine struggle with the, that, those aspects of ourselves that draw us away from God. That it, that, and in, therefore involves genuine change. I mean, if you put it like that, actually, how many of us really want to change? Most of us in our, Christ, in our Christian and our human lives have actually devised a way of living that we find we're quite happy with. Um, we don't want to change because change means entering onto something that's new and different and strange. And so the, one, the first point, it seems to me, about the doctrine of deification, which Maximus lays very great stress on, that it does involve genuine reformation of who we are. But this reformation is not changing us into something else. It is actually discovering who we really are as God created us. So the key to the doctrine, the, the key to the fact that, if you like, deification means humanization, becoming God means becoming genuinely human, is that to be genuinely human is to be as God created us, in his image. And we are all created in the image of God. There lurking in all of us, there is this image likeness to God, without which we would not be human. But for most of us, this image likeness to God has been covered over. It's muddy. It's messy, we can't see it. It's like a dirty icon. We need to clean it so that we can see who we are. Um, one of the great ascetic fathers of the, of the Eastern Church, um, Diadokos of Fotiki, one of the um, fathers included in the, in the collection, the Dabba Trilubia, the Philokalia, says that the image in which we've been created is like a picture which has been so badly damaged that it doesn't just need re-cleaning, it needs repainting. And he sees the acquisition of the virtues, the acquisition of the virtues of, the, the, of, virtues of chastity, um, love, faith, hope, okay. courage, and so on. He sees the acquisition of the virtues as actually painting the soul with the colors that it should have. This is a, a radical process, but not a process that changes the soul into something that it isn't, but reveals to us who we genuinely are. Does that make sense? Very good, Mr. Еще вопросы? Kas võib öelda, et see kes ma päriselt olen, et sellel on ka mingis mõttes nagu väga tihe seos sellega, kuhu ma sündisin, missugusesse peresse ma sündisin ja selle kontekstiga, kuhu ma sündisin. I started, when I, talk, when I talked about Maximus, I started talking about the trials, the, 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 the legal processes that he went through after his arrest in the last 10 years of his life. Um, there were two processes. One was the official trial, um, as a result of which he was condemned as a heretic. But they wanted, what they wanted was his recantation. It was a show trial, the sort of thing that we are very familiar with in the last century. The purpose was not 
to get Maximus, it was not just him to condemn him as a heretic, it's wanted to get him to say that he was a heretic. And so there's a, there's a second interrogation that took place a few years, about seven years later. And the, that second interrogation begins with the bishop who had been sent to interrogate him, Bishop Theodosius of Caesarea in Mycenae, starting off by saying, if I can remember exactly, Posechis kia maxime. How are you, Lord Maxime? And, and not kia maxime. Posechis kia abba. How are you, Reverend Father? And Maximus replies, I am as God in his eternal wisdom intended him to be from the ages. And I think Thedeus is a bit taken aback. That wasn't what he wanted at all. He just wanted to say, fine, thank you, and then go on. But Maximus then, then pursues this. He says, look, I am as God intended me to be in his providence. And so this is another element that's very important for Maximus, that we don't just live our lives... Um, we don't just sort of pursue our own course through this life and make it up as we go along. We are actually... We are created by God with a purpose, and the purpose of our life is to discover that purpose. The ultimate nature of that purpose is union with God. But everything that leads up to it has got a great deal to do with what we make of what God has given us in his providence. That our very existence, our parents, the place where we live, the, the relationships we have with people, even, even, even the landscape in which we live, all of these are gifts given to us. And we then have to make of this through ascesis, through this working with raw materials. We have to make of this what God intended. And it is a struggle that involves us. But it, when it's not taking place in a vacuum. It's taking place in the context of, in the context that God has given us. A context that consists of the kind of people we are, the kind of gifts we have, our parents, our relations, the country in which we live, all of this, all of these are to be taken into account. All of these are to be worked through. Does that help? I have a question about um, deification, becoming godlike. Mm -hmm. Does that inevit inevitably mean that we have to leave the material world or at least uh, detach ourselves, ourselves from the, uh, you know, from the... Uh, uh, from the everyday, you know, activities and pleasures that, that guide us today. You know, I'm, the question is more of a practical uh, issue mm -hmm. so I can, mm -hmm. you know, better explain it to my son and uh, understand it myself. Thank you. Quite a lot of Christian literature, perhaps I think all too much Christian literature, does give the impression that you have simply to abandon the world and, and um, pursue a life that is not in the world at all. And the reason for that is very simple. The, the, the bulk of the literature that's been written about this, even by Maximus, was written to monks who have left the world, gone to live in a monastery or gone to live in a hermitage or whatever. Um, and it envisages that particular context. But Maximus didn't only write to monks. As I said um, in the, right at the beginning, and a good deal of the first part of the lecture is concerned with a letter that he wrote to what is effectively a prominent politician in the Byzantine imperial court. <coughs> he wasn't somebody who'd left the world in that sense, but he was somebody who was very concerned to live a life in accordance with God, to, as, as Athanasius puts it in one of his letters, to Tozin to, um, to live in accordance with God, but to do this in the context of High politics, plenty of distractions, plenty of opportunities for wealth, plenty of opportunities for enjoying himself. What was important? Well, if you read Maximus's letters to him, what do you think it's, it's about how we live in the world, how we make use of the goods of the world. They can become obsessions, addictions, 
things that, 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 that take away our freedom, um, that, that, so that we become slaves to them in all sorts of ways, little ways and in big ways. And for Maximus, the struggle involved in the Christian life is a struggle to prevent these things becoming addictions or obsessions. And it's quite clear, I think, from Maximus that he doesn't mean by that that the only way of doing it is simply to deprive yourselves of all this, go and live in a monastery. That's not what he thinks at all. That is one way of doing it. And for some people, this will be important. If they do this, then they have a responsibility to their other Christians to share with them what they have learnt by taking this radical process. But most Christians aren't going to take this radical process. And Maximus is fully aware of this. Um, and some of his letters survive to people who were not taking that radical step. And for them, the importance is, the important question is, is making sure that our enjoyment of the world is not selfish, not addictive, not obsessive, that we are free in relation to what we enjoy. Um, it doesn't mean denying it altogether, but it does mean making sure that we are not lost in it. I think that is what I'd say. Thank you, Father, for your presentation. I had a question more about maybe language. Uh, St. Maximus, uh, very difficult to read sometimes, right? And even in the letter that you quoted from number two, very intense sections there, right? And my question is, uh, should we make efforts to not only understand the thought, the simple thought behind the texts, but is it worth it? Is it a worthy pedagogy for ourselves to uh, intensify this kind of grammatical, maybe on the, on the most basic level, or intellectual kind of uh, understanding? Is that effort, does it pay off? Uh, and what did Maximus himself think about that? If uh, I think I read somewhere that he himself was using ar more archaic forms of writing, or was it St. Simeon, the new theologian? Later, one of them was kind of consciously making his language a bit more uh, complex, right? And is it just context, or actually is that fineness of thought also a very important feature? Because you could just have simple thoughts, the truth of the gospel. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to see an opposition here. Um, and despite, I think there is no point in being obscure for the sake of it. Um, and there are some people who, who, well, there's a whole tradition of Western philosophy which thinks that being obscure is a sign of profundity. And that seems to me to be, I, I can see no point in this at all. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes it is actually difficult to express what it is that you want to say. Even a simple thought can be very, very hard to express in the language that we inevitably use. We, we, the language I use, I speak English, and I, I use English language, and so I, I use English concepts. These concepts have got a history and a context. I can't just sort of decide they mean what I want them to mean. I mean, I... Um, Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty thought he could, and words mean what they want them to mean. But that isn't, but won't work. Words carry a meaning with them. And sometimes that meaning pulls against what you're wanting to say. And I think when that happens, you do get a certain, a sort of, med I would call it a kind of meditative density about the thought, which is in one sense difficult, but is the difficulty is not being adopted for the sake of it. It's being adopted as a way of, of trying to struggle through the way in which your language, the language you speak, um, the way in which this language is pushing you in the direction you don't really want to go. Heidegger said all sorts of things, but he said one thing, that we don't speak a language, a language speaks us. And there's some truth, there's a lot of truth in this. That the, the language we use comes to us. I mean, I don't, I may choose what words to use, but I choose what words to use from an array, from an array of words that exist. If I made up words as I went on, you wouldn't understand me. 
um, I have to use words that, 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 we, that we have a kind of accepted sense of. And I think that does pose enormous problems. And I, um, but, but you say, sorry, I haven't been clear. I, I think that sometimes in order to be clear, one has to work one's way through a kind of, a sort of, um, what is a, what the expression I use now? A kind of, um, kind of linguistic density uh, in order to clarify the terms that we use. Um, and actually, it's, it's, these are not new ideas. Um, I mean, a whole, um, over the last hundred or so years, lots of people in different, in, 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 in the European world, which is the only one I know anything about, have, have talked in these terms. I mean, Malame famously talks about trying to purify the language of the tribe. Now, what lies behind that is the sense that the language of the tribe is something which is not pure and will constantly pull you away from where you're wanting to go if you're wanting to say something clear and simple. Um, and um, that, I think, is true. But I don't think there's any point in, in, in pursuing front of for its own sake. The only thing I would add, one of the reasons why Maximus is often very difficult is because I... I suspect, though we, don't, we know nothing about his, his, his early years, I mean, uh, really, uh, but I, sus I rather suspect that Maximus read a great deal when he was young, but didn't have a proper rhetorical training. He's very, very bad at um, using rhetorical method. Um, if you compare him with, later on in the century, John of Damascus, John of Damascus had a really good rhetorical training. He can do what he likes with Greek. He's, he's, he's. Maximus can't do this. And Maximus actually once says in the beginning of one of his letters that, that, that he's, he's not skilled in the technique of words. And I suspect that, that is actually just, it's not a, um, a modesty topos. I think he may well, for one reason or another, have missed out on a proper rhetorical education. He might have been not well as a child or something. He read lots, but he finds it, sometimes finds it quite difficult to express what he wants in a, in a simple way. I mean, his sentences very often go on for a, a column of mean or even longer because he keeps on, keeps on modifying it. But he's not trying to be obscure. He's trying to be clear. And in some cases, he can be very clear. But the letter you meant, letter two, as you say, there are passages in letter two that are very, very obscure indeed, because Maximus is wanting to, to, to capture his thought in a, um, in a, in a concise way um, and finding that this involves a kind of density that is forbidding, something like that. Thank you very much. It was an It was absolutely fantastic start. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.